friends i will come all for this 20th webinar of corporate professional and i am overwhelmed with your response that more than 1200 people registered today for this program friends as you are aware that this program on valuation valuation standards and valuation professional this is our endeavor to to spread knowledge and bring out topics which are topical friday is a day of sharing knowledge we are putting our efforts to identify relevant topics and the most important to invite the best faculty for this purpose and today we are fortunate we have invited mr manoj pandey who is the joint secretary of nca mr pavan kumar he is the executive director of uh, insolvency uh, uh, board and looking after the valuation mr mark jaila he is the uh, is, um, uh, he is um, chairman of ibsc uh, international standard board on valuation and then chandra sahani so today we have two regulators one who is the expert in standard and then one valuation professional friends before starting this program i just want to introduce the learned speakers today we have mr manoj pandey who is the chief guest today for this program he is irs officer law graduate and mba and presently holding the position of joint secretary nca earlier he has served the commissioner of income tax and additional director general and advisor competition commission of india and had been a part of delegation to the number of international conference like icn brics un unitec and bilateral negotiation with authorities of other countries he has been on deputation of uh, earlier occasion with different ministries and department of government of india including department of expenditure ministry of finance government of india we welcome you sir for this uh, webinar of very interesting topic on valuation then our second speaker uh, guest of honor mr pavan kumar he is an irs officer presently posted an executive director in ibbi holds mphil degree and he is a fellow member of icma he joined uh, he joined as income tax department as assistant commissioner and worked as commissioner of income tax at jalandhar and alwar he was also deputed to mca as director he joined as director tax policy in department of revenue ministry of finance he was also a member of international expert group and various international bodies and uh, working on indicators of international commercial frauds uh, we welcome manoj kumar pavan kumar sir and uh, my relation with pavan sir is lo long back when we worked together in mca 21 in ministry of corporate affairs and he was director there uh, 15 years back then we have invited today mr mark al jaila is a managing director of jaila valuation advisor llc in atlantica georgia based valuation and litigation consulting firm he holds bba and mba degree and completed the merger and acquisition program and valuation program he is a certified public accountant a certified in financial for uh, financial forensics a chartered financial analyst and an accredited senior appraiser in with the american society of appraisers certified in business valuation mr mark is the chairman of standard review board of international valuation standard council he has been the member of various business valuation committee a frequent presenter and author on valuation issues and faculty at the federal judicial center in the national judicial college teaching business valuation concept to judges we welcome mr mark and mr mark has written the forward of our book on valuation and we are grateful to mr mark for joining this in the early morning uh, um, at 9 o'clock at your place welcome mr mark we all will be benefited by your experience and your journey on standards then we have uh, chandra sahani mr sahani is a uh, he is a ica and icsi member and registered valuer of ibbi he possesses 14 years of experience specializing in business valuation and transaction advisory he is a director and head of valuation practice of corporate professional having exposure of more than 1000 valuation chandra is a member of uh, he has served as a member of central government committee on Ed to advise on valuation matters constituted by mca and also as member of national mna council of association 
He co-authored India's first comprehensive book on valuation under the new regulated regime, Business Valuation in India, Beyond the Numbers, covering the international valuation standard and practical aspects, and also face behind the web portal in the unstructured field of business valuation, that is corporate valuation dot in. We welcome Chandar for this. So today's program we have structured in such a manner that after my introduction on topic, Chandar will speak of the landscape of valuation in India. Then Mr. Mark will speak on the IVSC presentation perspective on international framework in developed countries, need and importance of valuation standard and global best practices. And Mr. Pawan Kumar and Manoj Pandey sir will discuss a perspectives and need of institutional framework on valuation in India and the draft value will road ahead. And after that, we will discuss, uh, we will have question answers. Some questions we have received, we will uh, share with the respective participant. Anybody has any question, you can pass on to us. We will uh, ask the respective speaker. So I welcome all for this program. And friends, before starting this, uh, I just want to tell price is what you pay. Value is what you get. It is Warren Buffett famous statement. Now this statement indicates price versus valuation. The valuation and price uh, are two different things. Subjective versus objective. This is start a beautiful debate on what value, whether valuation is an art or science. Every valuation is different because every value Valuer has his own perception. And this is that difference of opinion. And here comes to judicial scrutiny and the judicial pronouncement. And then comes to need of uniformity. And the uniformity required concept of comparability. And this comparability required that we should have some standard data and then the standardization of valuation. Valuation is, is a nascent phase in India because till now we have seen valuation is a unstructured process. Valuation was not a part of any focus thing, though every transaction, whether regulatory, whether it's a, a personal transaction, the valuation is the foremost thing. So today when there is a need that uh, there are so many issue has come in the valuation. So the question comes, who will do? What knowledge you should possess? What ethical value you should have? and what standard you require. For these, first time in Companies Act 2013, it was a proposed that there should be a concept of registered valuer. And then in 2017, registered valuer bill uh, came into picture. Then committee was formed. And then report has submitted and the valuer bill is in uh, the process. So the journey of valuation has taken a long way. And now it is time that we should make all these things at the institution and we convert the valuation as an institutionalization process so everybody should follow and everybody specifically those who are uh, uh, using this they should have a trust trust is the most important thing and the trust will come when you have an ethical value ethical value require the various aspects for this today we are discussing all these issues journey of international what the government is thinking, what is the future, and what the registered valuer are thinking. Now over to you, Chandar. You can start your presentation, and then Mr. Mark will take over. Right. Thank you so much. So <clears throat> without wasting any time, uh, I would like to speak as little as possible. And the objective is to give the macro framework on a very topical uh, issue, which is valuation, valuation standards, and valuation profession. So the presentation has been segregated into these three topics, as you can see, valuation, valuation standards, and valuation profession. Let me just take you through the history of business valuation in India first. We started doing valuations in our country from the days of Well Tech Act 1957. And from 1957 till about 1992, there was only one valuation methodology, which was Comptroller of Capital Issue Guidelines which we used to call as erstwhile CCI guidelines. And it was a formula driven valuation. So whether you do valuation or XYZ does valuation, the price and the ultimate value was same because it was a formula driven. When in 1992 SEBI came, 
then the concept was changed to free pricing mechanism and after that what has happened is that from 2008 till now so that means in the net, in the last 12 years a lot of regulations have come which has made the valuation process and profession interesting at the same time a little complex also just to give you a few dates sebi came out with the fairness opinion requirement on valuation in 2008 then income tax prescribed valuation for transfer of shares in 2009 for the first time in our country in 2010 we had seen the words discounted cash flow method which was prescribed by rbi for all the fdi transactions and as we know that dcf is one of the internationally acclaimed and you know universally accepted methodology after that for issuance of shares valuation methodology was prescribed by income tax in 2012 very important development took place in 2016 when a fair value standard came because india converged to india so earlier we were doing historical cost accounting we did we start we moved to fair value accounting and india's 113 which is actually a global equivalent of asc 820 of us gap and ifrs 13 internationally so fair value standard as on date is probably the only government issued standard wherein you can look at the concepts of market participant fair value hierarchy valuation methodology so in days 113 is probably where it exists in the same year in 2016 a very important development took place and insolvency and bankruptcy code came into force when ibc brought in the concepts of liquidation value and fair value of the assets of the corporate debtor then in 2017 to be precise on 18th of october 2017 the registered valuer provisions came into force and companies registered valuer and valuation rules 2017 came after that icai institute of chartered accountants of india issued a icai valuation standard in 2018 so there was a central government committee who is in the process of framing the valuation standards in the country under rule 19 of the registered value rules but till the time that committee finalizes any standards any rvo is has an option of framing a standard so icai framed a standard which is applicable to the institute of chartered accountant members under the companies act specifically and the latest development in 2020 is that the central government appointed committee of expert has submitted a report on the institutionalized framework of valuation in india and also with a copy of draft valuer bill 2020 which is in the review of the central government there are four guiding principles of valuation which are very important the first principle is that companies create value when the return on capital employed increase their it is more than their weighted average cost of capital so your cost is about 10% you earn about 12% that 2% is what creates value for you second point is conservation of value wherein the valuation of a business is actually and linked with the underlying cash flows on the valuation of operations the point i wanted to make here is that accounting numbers may be misleading while doing valuation we should be more concerned with the net cash flows of a business and the value from operations thirdly demand supply and equilibrium will decide a transaction value is always fundamental whereas price is relative and market driven can we match it is a question ideally we should match practically we may not fourth and last is economies of scale that if when you grow a business it increases value but for that the positive cash flows is important so for example there is a startup and the startup is running and ultimately it is not able to create any profits and cash flows in future also practically there is no value why we need valuation to my mind there are three requirements why one requires valuation the first is an actual transaction is taking place someone is buying a company selling it raising funds there could be a dispute there could be a voluntary assessment second could be a regulatory requirement like we just seen we have seen income tax rbi companies act ibc there are different valuation requirement where is statute ask us to do valuation and last is financial reporting wherein whenever you do accounting there is this fair value concept came come into play and we require the valuation for that 
globally there are only three valuation approaches income asset and market so it is already standardized in terms of approaches across business cycle if you see then if there is a startup company and if there is a declining company both cannot be valued which is the same valuation methodologies so the early the company the more is the focus on the future business model and the qualitative aspects as the company moves from startup to mature company focus is given more on the assets of the company and also business but while we move to declining company let us take an example of an ibc company there actually the valuation is not of the business the valuation is of the assets of the corporate debtor because the company has already entered into a declining stage so the income approach is not considered appropriate considering the stage of the business coming to the second point of valuation standards my first question and the slide says that what is a valuation without standards is it half full or is it half empty this is the present situation of india wherein some valuers look at it half full some valuers look at it half empty everybody wants and does valuation based on their understanding and maybe everyone is correct maybe no one is correct but there is an importance that before we go into the technical standards of valuation there is a requirement of ethical standards of valuation and if we look into ibsc code of ethical principles it it has given some ethical practices of integrity objectivity competence confidentiality and professional behavior interestingly if we look into the mca companies registered value rules it has also more or less match with the ethical standards which are there in ibsc ibsc in terms of integrity and fairness professional competence independence and disclosure and due care so the point i wanted to make here is that there is a need for uniformity today india is seen by global investors it is not that a person in us is following a different principle a person in india is following a different principle india is already ifrs converged so Uh, indian accounting is already on a fair value basis and so should be the valuation standards also so there is a need of international valuation standards there is a need of indian valuation standards to what extent we can converge indian valuation standards with international valuation standards that is the question of debate but we need to find a solution we should have an ethical standards and more importantly we need to have a minimum performance framework which i'll take it up later on because only standards to my mind will not do justice standards plus minimum performance framework put in combination will actually result in the requirements of our country now valuation resources and practice guidelines what i have done here there is a very old revenue ruling 1959 60 which we still refer while doing valuation in our country and it says that there are eight important factors for any valuation you look at the nature of the business economic outlook and industry book value earning capacity dividend paying capacity intangible value sale of the stock and market price if you look at it practically it says that you need to look at the income asset and market approach you need to look at the company the history of the company the future of the company the industry and the economy and that is actually what we do in practice there are a few guidelines when we do a controlling stake valuation there is this ipev guidelines why i am mentioning here is that if anyone wants to study and because the topical the topic here is institutional framework we need to first understand what exists around the globe and if we can take the best practices even even they, these may not be mandatory but if there is something available around the world because this valuation is universal even if you do valuation in india or uk or us the principles don't change so for controlling stake valuation there is this ipev guidelines for minority perspective valuation there is this aicpa guidelines and besides that there are valuation standards interestingly i could find when i was doing research for this webinar i could find that this this research paper covers the valuation standard comparison around the world if you look at this particular research paper it tells us that there are practically not many differences whether you look at ibs or you look at indian valuation standards or you look at icai standards or you know aicpa standards that issue largely is more technical versus more professional 
because like i mentioned before the standards don't tell us how to value standards can put us in the field but one will still make a 100 and another will still make a 20 and a third one then will still be bold so here the point is that some are technical some are judgmental but yes more or less the standards are not different across the world mandatory performance framework just 30 seconds i want to give here standards give us the principle of valuation but the mandatory performance framework which is also called as a ceib credential which is uh, given in us actually tells us how much to do so standard tells us we have to do due diligence but it doesn't tells us how much to do it tells us you have to do documentation to what extent it doesn't tell us you have to investigate to what extent it doesn't tell us so what has happened is that ceib credential is the latest addition in us wherein the the asas are can get this uh, ceib credential and they will get this credential when they will do to these extent so their work must have in depth analysis a lot of what to do how much to do is addressed by mandatory performance framework i would request mark to just touch upon this when he addresses but this is very important thought and lastly as far as the standards are concerned we need to understand what are the regulations on valuation local valuation requirements because the local valuation requirements override the valuation standards it is a permissible departure under the valuation standards including ivas and including icai valuation standards and any other standards because in our country and in any other country for a companies act might have required some valuation and income tax might have required some valuation if a valuation is prescribed by statute we need to first know it and after knowing it we need to actually do it also coming to the valuation profession i would like to conclude that the registered valuer are now legally recognized there is a regulated profession uniform practice and there is an urgent important need of skill set capacity building and common education and training registered valuer has already registered valuer rules came in 2017 three asset classes were made the issue here is that right now registered valuer is covering only the companies act and ibc and uh, valuation standards are under formulation the prescribed contents of valuation report are also already there and let me just tell you as a practitioner that if you look at any registered value report and any other report the registered value report is much better because there is a format prescribed of valuation there are contents which are written with standardization always helps last i want to make here is that the committee of expert has given some recommendations and Uh, it has recommended to establish a national institute of valuers for the development and also regulation of valuation profession very interestingly a very good uh, insertion here in scope is that the framework should not be limited to companies act and code and gradually it should cover all the valuations there is a presumption of bona fide and protection of valuation protection of valuers which i like the most because valuation is highly subjective so here the inherent bona fide i mean if unless and until you prove otherwise the valuation is considered bona fide and the valuers are protected because valuers are to be taken action only by the institute and there is a requirement of valuation standards so with this i conclude my summary presentation and we look forward to hearing from mark and also the learned officials from mca and ibbi so that's it from my side and that thank you uh, yeah thank you chandra for giving this now mr mark uh, uh, the uh, you can uh, give your perspective of i an institutional framework in a developed country so over to you mark thank you i appreciate it thank you for this opportunity to be part of this esteemed panel i appreciate the the time and ability to uh, present to you i um, um as, as mentioned uh, in addition to being a practitioner and having my own firm Uh, here based in the United States I chair the standards review board of the International Valuation Standards Committee and so in the presentation today what I'd like to do is talk about the IVSC its structure what we see our role is and then just a little bit about how the standards that are produced by the IVSC which are known as IVS International Valuation Standards 
the format and the structure of those particular standards and um, why they might be applicable to not only um, internationally, but, but more particularly, obviously, in, in India. Um, and then I'm going to speak a little bit about the profession, at least how it's evolved in the United States and the development of the CEIV credential and the mandatory performance framework that Chander had mentioned and how it possibly could be applicable to the work that uh, you're doing in India. And then um, just touch on that perhaps some, what the IVSC is doing for best practices, um, an agenda consultation, what we're seeing as far as the valuation profession in different areas and some of the other areas that we're perhaps going to touch on uh, in the future. So um, as part of the IVSC, one of the, the slogans or taglines that the IVSC uses that I like to uh, start with is that um, their, their slogan is valuation matters. And what they mean by that is that, you know, whatever the reason for conducting the valuations, as, as Chandra had pointed out in his presentation, whether it's financial reporting or mergers and acquisitions or asset acquisitions, insurance, determining the capital adequacy of financial institutions, that reliable and comparable valuations are a vital process, part of the process. So the, the fundamentals is that the, a proper valuation is a foundation for stable and um, um, stable and sustainable financial markets. So what we do, and one of the things I wanna emphasize uh, um, throughout my presentation is that we as valuation practitioners need to understand what we do is in the public trust. And as part of the public trust, we um, um, have a, a duty as, as a profession, if we truly are a profession, um, to provide uh, competent um, uh, valuations. Um, because we, the work that we do and for those wide variety of purposes are part of the public trust, there's been some concerns about the valuation professions. We're going to hear a little bit later in the program from um, two regulators uh, about their views of the valuation profession in India, uh, but, but it's been worldwide. Um, in the, and I, here in the United States, uh, one, one quote I like to, to present was from Paul Beswick, who was the Deputy Chief Accountant for the Security Exchange Commissions in a 2011 AICPA National Conference on Current SEC and PCOB uh, developments, said, today I'm here to advocate for the building of the public trust in a profession that's increasingly intertwined with our own, that is the valuation profession. And what Mr. Beswick meant, I believe, with that is more and more frequently, valuations are becoming part of not only um, uh, financial statements, but also just all wide varieties of types of interest where the public trust is involved in, in the valuation. And Mr. Bezirk was, was mentioning in this speech that there were some concerns about, about the profession. Um, and, and I'm going to relate this to standards and, and, and regulation, but, but the concerns at the time were um, unlike other professions, if you think about law profession or accounting profession, in those professions, there's a um, common education requirement. And at the time, there wasn't really a common education requirement for valuation specialists. There was a common set of methodologies uh, in, in performing accounting and um, legal work, but there's not the same level of common methodologies uh, for valuations, at least at that particular point in time. And then most importantly, as it relates to the work that, that we do at the IBSC in accounting and law and, and other similar professions, there's a common set of standards. Well, in valuation, the standards, if, if there are standards, they're usually part of a valuation professional organization or it's, it's, it's by region or it's by country or it's by a professional organization. There isn't a common set of standards. So I say that to highlight, to advocate um, looking to IVSC and IVS as an umbrella, as a common set of valuation standards to enhance the public trust that we do in as a profession, not only here in the United States or in India or or wherever, but worldwide, that we're one common profession that we would adhere to a, a set of standards. A um, couple of overarching comments um, that why there's a need for a common set of 
valuation standards, global multidisciplinary standards, is that investors are, are increasingly global. So the capital markets are, are free flowing. And um, you know, the recent economic turmoil notwithstanding. Um, so investors are commonly commonly global. Doesn't matter, they'll invest in here in the United States, they invest in India, India invests in companies in Europe, but it's the the, the common mark capital markets are, are fluid. Um, valuation is global. Because investors are global, valuations need to be performed on a common and consistent stand, set of standards because of the international nature of the, of the capital markets. Our clients are increasingly global. We work with clients that are um, headquartered in Atlanta, but perhaps have operations in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, headquartered in India, but perhaps have operations here in the United States. Or we work with companies that have headquartered here in the United States, perhaps are making acquisitions in Europe or in Asia. So um, companies are increasingly global. So it, do, it shouldn't matter where the, the company is located, the, the valuation methodologies should be performed under a common set of standards. Um, there's an increased scrutiny by regulators about what we do because of the work that we do is in the, in the public trust. Um, there's a quote by the former chairman of, of the board of trustees of the IBSC, Sir David Tweedy, that I like to use to highlight the um, the, the need for common set of valuation standards. And, and Sir David was, before he became the chairman and, and recently retired, but before he became chairman of the board of trustees of the IBSC, was chairman of the board of the International Accounting Standards Boards, which is responsible for um, setting accounting standards, IFRS. But, but Sir David says it makes no sense for a similar valuation being undertaken in Moscow or Madrid or Melbourne, or I'll add Mumbai, um, to be conducted in entirely different ways. The financial community needs the valuation profession to come up with one accepted set of high quality inter uh, global valuation standards. So we at the IVSC, we, we view our mission as a goal to build the public trust in valuations by establishing globally consistent high quality multidisciplinary valuation standards, which is known as IBS. So IBS not only um, set standards for business valuations or intangible assets or interests in business, but we also have standards for tangible assets and personal property. And we also just recently in the last year or so started a technical board for setting standards for financial instruments. And because financial instruments, you know, obviously given the the last economic crisis, 2007, 2008, um, there was an increasing need uh, as viewed by regulators to have one set of global standards for just financial instruments. Um, so again, you know, and as, as IBSC views its mission in achieving these goals, the IBSC seeks support of businesses, strengthen financial markets and protect again, the public interest. So our role, we view, we're an independent standard setter for the valuation internationally. We develop, consult on, and set high-level uh, pr principles-based standards for the valuation of all types of assets. The IBS are adopted by guidelines uh, issued by value various valuation professional organizations across the world, by regulatory authorities, and by valuation service providers. Um, the IBSC doesn't accredit or we don't license valuation professionals, which is done either under statutory agency of a professional um, body or, or, or a local regulator or by a valuation professional organization. We view our role as an independent not and a not-for-profit organization. We ensure that valuers and the valuation profession more broadly has a robust and internationally agreed set of standards in place. So we don't license, we don't accredit, but we set a globally multidisciplinary set of standards that we believe that can be adopted um, um, internationally by, by all, all parties. Um, the IBSC is comprised of various members. Uh, there are corporate members, there are valuation professional organizations, there are associate valuation professional organizations, um, institutional members, academic members. So um, there's a wide variety of types of members that enhances the standard setting process because of the unique interest from each of those different bodies. 
So as, at the IVSC, when we're setting standards and as chair of the standards review board, we try to be as transparent and inclusive as possible. So we seek public comment on everything we do. We have, very, as part of our meetings, portions of our meetings are open to the public so that we can receive uh, feedback. Um, we're in a process of issuing an invitation, a comment on an agenda consultation about where we go forward with, with uh, IVSC, uh, IVS, um, International Evaluation Standards. Currently, professionals in 103 different countries are applying IVS in some one form or another. In some mar and it, it varies from markets. Some markets, it's enshrined in law. Um, some markets, it's part of an adoption of valuation professional organizations. Some, it may be a, an organization accrediting body like the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors have adopted IVS as part of their red book as their own set of standards. Um, the organization IVS is led by a board of trustees, a very um, um, impressive group of individuals. Um, and it's broken out into um, a standards review board, an advisory forum from, for evaluation professional organizations to provide advice and to uh, increase the use of IVS internationally. And we have a membership and standards recognition boards, which helps valuation professional organizations worldwide as, as they developed. How we set standards briefly is that there, the standards review board is an overarching uh, board that is set, uh, whose goal is to harmonize valuation standards across disciplines and to enhance the valuation profession uh, internationally. In, in the process of setting standards, um, there are three technical boards that, are, uh, that report to the standards review board. There's a business valuation board, a tangible assets board, and a financial instruments board. When we set standards, if the standard relates to one of the boards or perhaps more than one of the boards, we bring members of those boards and have them um, develop the technical aspects of standards. And when they're through with that process and when we go through our, our exposure process, it's brought to the standard review board to harmonize the standards, make sure it's consistent across all disciplines. So thus the, the actual IVS is the product of the, of the standards review board. Um, just briefly, how what IBS includes um, IBS International Valuation Standards. We have an, um, a glossary of common valuation uh, definitions. We have a framework of how IBS is, is developed, and then the the IBS the standards themselves are broken out into two broad categories. There are general standards that apply to all disciplines, and these general standards are scope of work, so the amount of work that needs to be done. Um, investigation and compliance, how much information is needed as part of the valuation process. There's a reporting standard so that we have commonality in how we present our findings. Uh, there is a basis of value, meaning the different definitions or standards of value for different per valuation purposes. And then we have a common um, general set of standards on valuation approaches and methods, cost, market, and income, which was uh, mentioned earlier. And then the second part of IVS is broken into various asset standards. Um, there is a IVS 200, which relates to businesses and business interest, IVS 210, intangible assets, 300, plant and equipment, 400, real property, uh, 410, developmental property, and 5ES is, is financial instruments. And, and financial instruments, the IBS 500 is currently being reviewed by the new financial instruments board and, and, in, and in process of being enhanced. And then there's an index. So, so just that brief overview of the, the umbrella organization shows how truly um, multidisciplinary um, IBS is as, as far as, as in the valuation profession. Um, the other role of the standards review board and the technical boards is to enhance the valuation profession itself. And as such, as part of our outreach, we um, regularly consult with other standard setters. We um, consult with, for example, the IASB, International Accounting Standards Board, on accounting standards that perhaps will um, that have a, a valuation impact. Um, we have we consult with the um, FASB staff members on various 
accounting standards here in the United States. We have a member that's part of the um, uh, uh, a working group for the IASB, the Audit and Ask Testation Standards Board. So we're involved with a number of different organizations um, across the world internationally to enhance the valuation profession with other um, valuation uh, with other standard setters. So that's the, the framework of, of IVSC, a little bit about the organization itself and about international valuation standards and the process of how we um, go through and enhance valuation standards. Um, one the quick comment about valuation standards, it, it used to be IVS would um, refresh their standards every three years or so and 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 dated it you know by by the year that that was issued for example the um, recent uh, recent valuation it was 2017 IVS and before that I believe it's 2014 we've changed the the how we view that we want uh, international valuation standards to be living set of standards similar to accounting standards so we were patterning ourselves after how accounting standard setters set standards so we don't we no longer have IVS 2000 we have just IVS and the latest iteration was was this year 2020 um, where we're issuing instead of just wholesale changes we're just enhancing or adding standards we're issuing a basis of inclusion why we change it similar to accounting standards setters um, we have technical revisions similar to accounting center standards so with that that's IVS um, hopefully how we view the the accounting profession um, in, in, or I'm sorry, that the valuation profession and its interaction with the accounting profession, why there's a public interest in valuations. And so therefore, as a profession, we have a need to enhance the public trust in our, in our work, thus the need for a common set of multidisciplinary global um, valuation standards. So I'm going to turn my attention um, briefly from that to um, something that has kind of occurred in the United States that may impact how in India that you're viewing um, setting valuation standards. And that's the development of the CEIV or Certified in Entity and Intangible Valuation Credential and, and the mandatory performance framework, which is associated with that. And in the um, mandatory, the uh, CEIV credential, just brief history, at the beginning of my remarks, I mentioned the, the comment by Paul Beswick, um, who is the Deputy Chief Accountant of the SEC, about concerns about the valuation profession. So in response to Mr. Beswick's comments, the, uh, the Appraisal Foundation based here in the US, um, leaders from the big four and other um, valuation um, specialists, the AICPA, AST, and RICS, all got together and formed a roundtable discussions of how to respond as a profession to Mr. Beswick's remarks. And the outcome of that was something called the Fair Value Quality Initiative. And the Fair Value Quality uh, Initiative was to set four working work streams of governance and coordination, qualifications, performance requirements, and quality control. And the outcome of all that over a number of years was the development of the CEIV credential. So the CEIV credential hopefully meets the concerns of regulators as to common set of education requirements, common set of experience requirements, common set of um, um, uh, quality assurance, quality monitoring um, requirements, uh, for valuations, at least in financial reporting purposes. And it's the first designation that is issued by one of three valuation organizations. So it's issued through either the AICPA, the American Society of Appraisers, or the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. So you go through that process. There's a common set of um, requirements within each organization, a common exam, common education requirements, and then you obtain the your CEIV credential through, through that organization. But it's one credential issued by three organizations. First time that that's ever happened. 
Previously, the group valuation credentials are just part of valuation professional organizations or, or through regulators. So it's the first time that that happened. And so now, at least that the thought process is, if you have a CEIV, there is that enhances the public trust and valuations that there is um, requirements for those individuals. Uh, at least there's a uh, provides not a requirement because it's not a, you're not required to have it to do that type of work, but it increases the level of confidence in the work if you have that credential. Um, as part of that, the anyone that has a CEIV credential and um, or is performing valuation um, for financial reporting purposes, if they are a CEIV, they have to follow something called the mandatory performance framework. If they are not a CEIV but still doing work for financial reporting purposes, it, it falls to the level of best practices. And as Chander mentioned previously, the mandatory performance framework is not a how-to, but a how much. And it provides specific guidance on documentation, how much information is needed, um, the entire process to make sure that there is a common process and common um, set of um, steps and information that one does to put together to do valuations for financial reporting purposes, um, at, at least here in the United States. But it's as you know, we're, we're talking today. It's 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 obviously begun to uh, uh, spread internationally. So the mandatory performance framework is something that I think is designed specifically for man for valuations for financial reporting purposes. However, I think as a valuation profession, even if you don't practice in that area, I think it makes good sense to be familiar with the mandatory performance framework because it's just it's things it's common sense things that we all should be doing in any type of of, of valuations. Um, so with that, um, just a couple of things that the IVSC is working on as far as best practices. And then, you know, if you have any questions about uh, any issues that have come up, um, uh, you know, we certainly will uh, be able to address it. But, but a couple of things just to be aware of, um, both the International Accounting Standards Board and the FASB in the United States are considering changing the model for testing goodwill for impairment. So you know, the IBSC in response to that has issued a series of perspective papers on the nature of goodwill and how we view goodwill and why, even though the current models may not be perfect, it does provide useful information to the users of financial statements. And then our last paper is maybe offering some advice or some thoughts as to how perhaps it can be approved. Um, we issued a paper from the technical board, the standards review board and the three technical boards on valuation uncertainty, which is valuations in times such as now, where their information, the markets have changed, there may not be perfect information, how we do things, um, um, you know, formally before this current economic upheaval um, occurred may not be appropriate. So things to think about, not risk from the investor perspective per se, but risk from the valuation, how you do your valuation. So that paper is available. And so we're working on a couple of things like valuations for um, ESG, um, environmental, social, and governance. That, that may be, that's becoming increasingly important. We're looking at internally generated and tangible assets, how perhaps that might be an, an improvement for financial reporting. Um, uh, so we're, there, there's a number of items that we're looking forward. And then you know, when we issue this invitation to comment on our agenda consultation going forward, we really would appreciate everyone you know, taking a look at that and providing some feedback with that. So with that, I'll um, you know, entertain questions later on, but, but turn it over to the rest of the presenters. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mark. Uh, thanks for uh, giving him, uh, the insight uh, of the um, uh, entire journey of yours, uh, IVSC, and the international practices. Now I'll request Mr. Pawan Kumar to give a prospectus on need on this institutional framework on valuation in India and draft valuation bill and road ahead. Mr. Pawan Kumar, please. Thank you, Pawan. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, I think uh, Chandar and 
has laid out very beautifully the landscape in India, how the profession of valuation has evolved. And Mark has also given a perspective to the standard setting of this. Pavan started with a statement that Friday is a day of knowledge. I would uh, differ with him and say that Friday evening is a day of joy, not only of knowledge. Friday morning is fine for gathering knowledge, but of course, evening, everyone, I think my friends, they all looking forward to enjoying a great weekend and having good time. So I would not take much of time and uh, considering the time constraint, I'll restrict myself to 10, about 10, 10, 12 minutes. Of course, uh, as we all know that uh, it is the age of professionals. Professions have emerged as a very key institution in the economic growth of any country. Since they perform, we believe that as a regulator, we believe that professions perform second order state functions. That is almost like a government. They perform an important function in the economy. And valuation profession, of course, is no exception to that. Of course, it has had a very, you can say, tumultuous journey so far as far as Indian landscape is concerned. Because we have, uh, like any other profession, they have also evolved over a period of time. Now, in India, we say that the freedom to exit and the Indian business scene, the players got only in 2016 with the enactment of IBC code. Freedom to entry and freedom to grow and freedom to exit. I believe these are three important uh, freedom for the life of any business. And you see that a profession is good as good as the trust and the respect it enjoys of the market participants. So the valuation profession, unless it enjoys the trust of the stakeholders, which is very important and key determinant of the way ahead. And looking at the perspective, we see that the valuation profession, I, in my opinion, it starts right from the birth of a business till the death of a business. At each point of time, the business entities need the services of a valuer. The valuation profession is like a, uh, you can say it is like a blood running through the veins of a business. So for for example, if it wants to start even, a, even a, at the time of when business you enter, you want to raise capital or you want to raise loan, then also you need a valuation. Without that, nobody will lend you money, not even a bank or financial institution will come forward. So even if you want to go for a subsequent uh, placement of share, if you look at an unlisted company, they have multiple rounds of funding from various private equity funds or from venture capital funds. So at each stage of their business growth, they need valuation. The point is what sometimes I wonder that we, when we go for a human body checkup, the valuation to my mind, it is very much akin to the diagnostic check of a human body. When you go, there are certain uh, lab labs which give you a standardized report, which is not disputed by the doctor who is looking at your, uh, uh, which who is clinically examining the patient. Similarly, in the case of evaluation, if you look at any business entity, when it goes to any market participant for raising capital, or for any other uh, transaction, whether it is a regulatory or whether it is any transactional kind of requirement, the other person is bound to ask you for another valuation report. He will not trust the valuation report which you carry or which a businessman carries. So why so? Why can't we have standardized testing? And that would come only when we have certain basic standards in place. Like Mark correlated it with the accounting standards. I was privileged to be a part of the accounting standards since I come from tax department and having a degree in uh, accounting. I was, Mark, just to tell you and my other friends that in Department of Revenue, I was, when, when the IFRS were introduced in 2016, the Department of Revenue had constituted a committee somewhere in 2012. And we have been working in that committee for last five, six years, seven years. 
continuously trying to evolve not only blindly adopt the ifrs but to adopt the accounting standards or think of indian carve outs we came out with indas and not only indas we went a step further and thought that how to compute taxable income in case of entities those who are preparing accounts based on ifrs based accounts so we came out with detailed guidance the point which i want to drive home is you talked about transparency i said we also in that committee it was not a close uh, team of only tax officials looking to raise resources we followed the concept of transparency in that committee out of 10 people only four persons we were there from revenue service rest six were professionals so who were taken from practice so idea was to have the domain experts on the field and a majority of them so that decisions which are taken are largely acceptable to the market players so borrowing the same principle i would say in the valuation profession the committee of experts which the government had constituted it also had similar kind of representation from a wide cross section of the society the idea was not only to just gather few valuers of course uh, the uh, the uh, the representation from that section was there but a cross section of the users of those services were also brought in because why we feel that the profession has to ultimately enjoy the trust of the stakeholders now if we look at any profession to my mind the the, the respect would come if we have the professional ethics in there the profession ultimately is based on knowledge skill and a code of conduct and ethical behavior so somebody rightly said there has to be values in the valuation profession so ultimately what matters is the what kind of values are we following while doing the exercise of valuation what in india we had so far is we did not had a holistic development of the profession neither the holistic regulation of the profession what chandra talked about was there were sporadic users of valuation services there are banks there are institutions there are income tax department there there is a sabi each or insurance or some other departments who are using the services and at the same time prescribing the requirements as to who can render those services and what standards they will follow to some extent they have prescribed the procedures also so as a result pockets of valuers who are catering to those exclusive users of services what we lack is a unified valuer who can write before his name vr like a doctor writes dr like a chartered accountant writes ca before his name or a company secretary like uh, likes uh, writes cs before his name unfortunately the stage has to come or it has rather already come and we are lagging in that is a person who is rendering the valuation services which are well recognized across the country by the different regulators across the country who rely on that and then a rights vrn is before his name and nobody asks what does vr represents so the point is unless we have a unified regulatory regime which gives recognition which gives you entry and entry is based on some sort of criteria some sort of basic qualification some sort of entry exam and then you are bound by a certain code of conduct you are liable for certain uh, wrong doings then only that professional misconduct if we go to a doctor we want a doctor if he gives me a wrong prescription we demand the extreme services that i am a user of his services so he should be accountable to me but at the same time when i am rendering services if i don't accept the concept of accountability then i'm sorry my my users are not going to put faith on me the faith from the users which is very important the faith from them is going to come only if i am accountable for the services for the report which i am giving we are not asking for the faith that the as chandra also said very rightly that the 
the concept of there were some concerns when the government came out with the draft bill was that unduly there are penal provisions the point is that they are first is the presumption of bona fide is there it is not that government will just press the trigger or the proposed regulator will will press the regular will press the trigger and go after the valuers no absolute presumption i can say please go through the provisions it is very categorically stated in the provision that presumption of bona fide is there it is the the rather it is the other way around the person who is saying he has to bring material on record that there is an element of wrong doing so which is very rare in cases it is same way like a government servant i am also accountable i am also bound by for the job which i am doing i am also am enabled to disciplinary action by my superior authority so to that extent an element of disciplinary proceeding has been brought in and i'm sure if we look at the insolvency professional which ibbi is uh, uh, is administering as a regulator even insolvency professional he is also amenable to same kind of disciplinary mechanism so it is not something new which has been brought so that is just to dispel the concerns of some of the friends which they may be having they are saying that entry norms are there we have whatever entry norms they exist today we have adopted the same the committee has suggested a least interruptive me mechanism and which is least disruptive i would say there has been an incremental change in terms of the present valuation structure valuation mechanism what my friend earlier said the valuation rules and which were notified by the government in 2017 which ibbi is has been regulated has, has been termed as the regulator to administer those rules we have taken care to continue with the same kind of regime because we already have more than 3300 valuers and i have today as on date more than 26 registered valuer entities so we are allowing even partnership firms and llps and companies as they are allowed under the present rules under the companies provisions of companies act we are allowing them to practice in the field of valuation and i'm sure you will be surprised to know that some of the study material which since we have front line regulators as registered valuer organizations i have 14 registered valuer organizations which are operating in the field the idea was to encourage them to perform the developmental role because as the central regulator we we foresee considering the length and the breadth of the country it will not be possible for the central regulator to extend our arms to the nook and corner of the country and ultimately to the valuer members who will be spread across the country the first hand holding has to be done by the informal organizations who are we call as the front line regulators and they will be charged with the role of developmental role their job will be to educate impart education and role the members develop the members give them continuing professional education because mark rightly said this is a field which keeps on changes are part of life every day some change is taking place accounting standards are changing so are the valuation standards so considering that there are so many challenges every day so i think though this profession is very very dynamic unless a valuer keeps himself updated and that is precisely the job of these organizations which are there in the field which have been interested with this responsibility to be in touch with these professionals and look into the concerns on day to day basis so our idea is to have that kind of dual architecture that is what has been adopted in the current bill also it has a two tier because when we see the early stages of development of profession whether it is accounting profession or any other profession it was earlier in the self regulation mode from self regulation the professional regulation moved to statutory regulation like institute of Chart chartered accountants like institute of company secretaries then it came co regulation 
and now following the same philosophy of co-regulation we are coming out with a two-tier architecture two-tier architecture consists of central regulator and frontline regulator so we are also for valuation profession this is the latest trend and we have come out with a incomplete law because as we see the job of regulator is not to prescribe everything rather the job of a regulator is to hit a moving target we do not know what is good today may not be hold may not hold good tomorrow so idea is the regulations with the regulations it is easier to regulate market practices and to evolve regulations keeping in mind the current market practices so that regulator but at the same time has to be made accountable to the society and that is why society has been given uh, representation and this regulation process itself has been made transparent because you, before drafting any regulation you have to put it in public domain generate public discussion seek the opinion of public uh, and other stakeholders including valuers and give them a say in the art of setting of these regulations and also table these regulations on the floor of the parliament so as to discharge your duty and be accountable to the public who is looking at our services and gain their confidence unless we i i i am again emphasizing that unless we gain the trust of the stakeholders we are not going to progress and you see we are also taking up for the initial stage we have said that all these services are compulsorily only for the valuations which are performed under the companies act as well as under the ibc code but you see how much debate this bill has generated the users of these services whether they are banks whether they are financial institutions or whether it is department of public disinvestment of assets they are also looking at our valuers because our valuers registered valuers are accountable for their actions so once you say that our valuation professionals are accountable it evokes considerable trust and confidence in the stakeholders you will be surprised to note that recently department of public disinvestment they came out with an advertisement for disinvestment of the government stake in some of the public sector undertakings so the moment the secretary of that department came to know that we have some sort of registered valuer which exists under the ambit of companies act he immediately called up dr sahu the chairperson of ipbi please send somebody to educate me who are these registered valuers because we want to make use of their services so the point is yes it gives me confidence that whether it is a pension fund whether it is a securities exchange board of india or whether department of revenue department of financial services ultimately we are not prescribing anything the users themselves are coming to us they will be using this their the services of registered values so that is the amount of confidence which is bound to come if we are transparent in our functioning if we are transparent in our standard setting as regards valuation standards is concerned government had already appointed a committee under the chairmanship of professor professor narayan swami who is a professor from iim they have submitted one report uh to the government another report also they submitted i think last month and third report today also there was a incidentally meeting at 2 o'clock to till 5 o'clock there was a meeting of that expert group so they are going in depth to come out with india specific standards i'm sure they are looking at those areas because ultimately standards are kind of uh, the again the the model uh, rule book which is going to lay down as Uh, chandar said if there are variations we are known we are aware that it is a it is not an exact science standards cannot prescribe anything they can only lay down the general principles they can't be prescriptive so ultimately the valuer has to take a call he has to apply his judgment so we are conscious and working on that so far has only securities and financial assets we have india specific standards otherwise the prescription for uh, registered valuers is to adopt or go for internationally 
accepted valuation standards or the standards which are prescribed by their registered valuer organization we are also looking at the area of disclaimers because we have had only three year existence in the market and ibbi is a unique regulator which is not only setting the rules of the game but also using this these values because insolvency regime provides for two values it it mandates under the law that insolvency professional has to get two valuation fair value valuation and the second is the liquidation value so i would say that ib also using the services of values and we as a user we have come across disclaimers which are being used so we are also uh, deeply looking into this is of uh, putting disclaimers in the valuation reports the idea is the disc go to the extent of even making the user feeling useless as to why i am uses so disclaimer has to be something is to be based on certain principles certain ideas where which does not make the valuation report unsuitable it has to guard against some sort of future liability arising from certain unknowns so it has to be reasonable and our central regulator is ibbi is going to as a guideline for our valuer members as to what sort of uh, disclaimers should be there so what in to conclude i would say that we are looking very holistically at the international uh, developments as well as we are aware of the concerns which feedback which we have received on the valuation bill government has also constituted a in house to look into the concerns of the valuer valuer members who have raised concerns and other members of the society we have received more than 80000 comments on the public domain so it is a herculean task to go into each and every comment we are nonetheless meticulously going through each of the concern which has been raised by elder and government will come out with an appropriate response to the draft bill and fortunately we we look forward to the good days hopefully this goes through the process and taken to the parliament for suitable legislation with these words i i leave this stage for my other colleague from the ministry to say words and thank you very over to you pawan thank you thank you very much for sir uh, thanks for giving uh, insight Interesting part is that uh, oh, your comment and Mr. Chandra will write B R Chandra Sahani in place of C A Chandra Sahani. That day is not far when this institution will take place its own position. It will come very nicely covered the ethical part and the other things. Uh, um, uh, now I will request uh, Manoj Pandey sir. Uh, have you are you back? Uh, because so. Manoj Pandey join at any time. He joined us. Uh, in the meantime, when Pandey sir comes, uh, I will. Uh, Pandey sir, uh, can you start? Okay. In the meantime, when Pandey sir will, I just ask uh, one question. Uh, your presentation. What are you expecting that this draft will will uh, make the? Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Pandey has come. Sir, uh, I will request you. I know secretary has called you, so please uh, uh, share your thought on this particular thing. Mr. Mark and uh, Pawan sir has discussed this point. Uh, over to Pandey sir. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Zain, uh, Mr. Pavan Kumar, Vijay, Mr. Pavan Kumar, Mr. Chandra Saini. Uh, uh, very warm morning to Mr. Zaila and to all other friends. A uh, uh, good evening. See, I am very happy to be associated with this webinar, which is quite topical. and very important in the matter of corporate governance and valuation 
as we all know since ancient times in the world the matter of valuation has always been recognized and it's a it has been recognized as a respectable part of the society while quite respected part of the society because see valuation or the valuation profession is not only linked with we say the valuation of the tangible or intangible assets but there are other professions also so we we are talking about the professionals professional organizations so medical practitioners engineers the architects and since ancient times of uh, in uh, world like ancient cultures ancient civilizations they have played a very very important role so professionals have very important role to play and they assume importance because they only know the worth of any tangible or intangible assets and i have heard during uh, this webinar also there is a difference between price and the value so uh, value only a person who is having a technical knowledge can say so a common person would ascribe a price to anything which will not be of that value because he would not be appreciating that what is this tangible or intangible is worth of and here the importance of the valuation profession and the standards come because unless until there is a standard or there is a profession around it the society would not recognize that we have to follow these standards and we have to approach these professionals to have a correct estimation of valuation unless until we have a correct valuation i think mr daila has said he was part of number of mergers and acquisitions also there could be a mergers and acquisitions being high price or for other parties paying quite a low price now that is not an ideal situation so what should we do now any society should have some standards should have some ethics now for standards could be on like medical standards could be on architectural standards accounting standards so there should be standards on valuation also because once you have a standard then everybody would follow it and here comes the background of having valuation standards committee and the ministry also constituted a valuation standards committee and committee also came out with some sets of uh, first first sets of recommendations the ministry the ministry of corporate affairs always looks for setting up of a good corporate governance and a good corporate culture now standards of valuation and valuers as a, a respectable profession in the society would play a very a very important role looking into it while we all are aware that the, in 2017 there were rules which were framed and those rules basically the authority uh, is ibbi to look into come basically the matters related to valuations and their ibc code but the rules also talk about the companies act 2013 thereafter a committee of experts was constituted to look into aspect whether there is a need for regulation and development of valuation professionals now that is a need of the hour why because the need of the hour is also because because uh, of the fact that we need a recognition and we need a recognition for a profession where a society on the whole can impose trust and the faith and that is required because unless there is a trust and the faith then the entire uh, in fact the edifice around which any profession is uh, built uh, basically doesn't gain gain a prominence in the society so committee of experts in fact constituted had a consultative process 
held number of meetings and after that holding uh, all these meetings then came out with certain sets of recommendations so it's a it was a huge consultative process which is taking place now when this report along with a draft bill when the report came with the draft bill it was placed in the public domain and a lot of comments and suggestions have been received and uh, after receiving all these public comments and suggestions the government would look into it so see it's a consultative process and after the, this consultation suggestions which uh, uh, which the government would look into it and thereafter a decision would be taken how to go about it so the report or the draft value of bill which is placed in public domain is was for public consultations and suggestions and it's it, it's required because any bill is made through a way of consultative process and certain a key aspects around it already mr chandra saini in his uh, in fact presentation has spelled out what uh is important to understand that we through this bill the attempt is to give a framework framework for development framework for regulation and to protect the valuers as well as the uh, persons who have built the valuation services it's all built on trust and faith and uh, basically around the trust the society should have on the valuation profession on the valuers as well as the as the service providers as for the institution we are we, which will be in place and also accountability towards the users so the misconduct part is only for though that portion which is not bona fide value the valuers which, which are at present uh, who are valuing different services different assets they belong to a particular they already have certain qualifications certain degrees and they have a place in society but do they belong to any organization like chartered accountants association of india the company secretaries association of india so there we find that if their framework is put in place there could be more developmental aspects to this profession the professions may develop more and more and this was the attempt and the attempt of the report of the committee was towards this only i uh, profusely thank the organizer of this webinar for having a brainstorming session on this issue as ministry always looks for a good corporate governance always looks for a consultative process and it's all through way of consultation that the any bill is drafted any paper which takes a final shape and there could be conflicting views there could be two opinions we the ministry Uh, takes everything into account by coming out with a policy but the for everything there is a time and whether the we have to think whether the time has come really to have a institution which should look into the development and regulation of a profession of a is of a very prestigious profession like valuation because it's a big big area because you are looking in into budgets acquisitions financial services even into ibc transactions the valuation in income tax valuation in wealth tax so uh, the recommendation of committee was uh, that okay phase wise can all these provisions can be brought in through the uh, uh, through this process and we we have we had invited suggestions we have received them and there would be a process uh, of uh, examining those recommendations and suggestions so with these words um, I, i i again 
thank Mr. Pavan Kumar Vijay, Mr. Chandra Sani, Mr. Mark Zaila, and uh, uh, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Pavan Kumar from IPPI. That, that it's a topical webinar which has been conducted today to elicit the views of not only the speakers, but also the participants. Thank you very much, Mr. Pavan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your uh, kind word. The most important thing which you have given a message that uh, uh, building of public trust in this profession of valuation is most urgent because trust and faith, this require ethical value and ethical value require standardization. So I think the message is loud and clear that as soon as this profession will grow, the ethical values and standard has to bring so public has more trust and regulator has more trust. Now, uh, we have received various questions, uh, but I know that all the answer of the questions uh, we can't give. But even then, I will take up certain questions which are people are asking and friends, those who have asked questions relating to their personal issues, that we will send it uh, uh, separately to you. Here, I will confine to those questions where Mr. Jala and Mr. Pandey and uh, Mr. Pavan Kumar can give, uh, and that will be useful for us. Uh, sir, uh, no doubt you have mentioned that draft bill is uh, working out and you have received various suggestions you are working out. But is there any uh, timeline where uh, you can suggest, Pavan sir, that uh, how much time will, will, will it will take, the bill will pass? Pavan, it is, it is difficult to put the time limit on the legislative freedom that is, uh, it, it is difficult to put up a time frame to that. The only idea is that we will be, uh, as my colleague has already said, we will be uh, going through each and every suggestion and then probably making uh, whatever way the final bill, this shape takes place and then probably take it to before the legislation. So it will not be actually easy to put a time frame. Okay. Sir, uh, presently there are so many uh, transactions because MCA, uh, Companies Act come under MCA and the SEBI, RBI, IT, uh, Income Tax comes under Finance Ministry. And if you see the valuation that there is a different valuation requirement like CA is giving valuation for uh, SEBI related thing and registered valuer is connected with Companies Act and the merchant banker is giving and CA is giving for IT. So when are you expecting that uh, because industry is facing problem that multiple uh, value is there multiple things is there so how much time do you think it will take that uh, you have the all the valuation in india will take place through the value that is what anybody? i said now users are becoming aware manoj yeah. would you like to respond I can only say that, Pavan, that uh, given our experience in the last uh, three to four months, what I can say is that this consultative process itself has evoked a lot of interest amongst other users. Like, for example, insolvency professional, you are aware that we, IBBI, is making use for them for the purposes of IBC. But you okay. see, Securities Exchange Board of India also are using our panel for use as administrators. So what I'm saying is that already we are getting queries from other regulators like Department of Financial Services, like Department of Disinvestment, of Public Asset Management, like insurance. They are already coming to us and, and they are asking about the, uh, the even some of the banks I, I i know that they are also taking up the question of this so ultimately i think we are living at this stage we are not prescribing for all of them but ultimately when this bill takes place the shape of a, a legislation then going forward one should have broader ambit but again it depends on the uh, the wisdom of the legislature in the proposed bill we are still saying that they are mandatory only for valuations. Let me clarify, they are 
for valuations under the Companies Act and under IBC only. We the okay. proposed bill does not talk about the others. So it is for other regulators to respond in the way they find it appropriate. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mark, uh, uh, how the IVSC standard are different with local valuation standard in different countries? And uh, because you are propagating for global standardization, so how they are different? Yeah, so I think one way to view IVS is, you know, as I mentioned in my remarks, it's um, multidisciplinary and it's intended to be international, it's principles based. So one way to think about it is an overarching set of standards, but since it's principle based, what we've seen in, in, in some markets being adopted wholly as is, some markets um, uh, applying, if they're local regulations, applying local regulations within a, an IBS framework or umbrella. And, uh, you know, that's, that's totally acceptable. So it's, it's something that we want to provide international guidance, um, but it's flexible enough to be adopted for local, um, local market situations. Okay, okay. Mark, uh, can you tell uh, when you have framed this valuation standard, what process you have followed and what are the problem you have faced? And the next is because I can uh, shortage of time, just uh, combining the question, how sure. far you have reached? Uh, so how, uh, when you have uh, started this standard uh, uh, valuation standard process, how far you have reached and what are the work is pending? Yeah. So, um, the way the process works is we issue an agenda consultation and we invite comments from constituents on various topics. So either topics that we believe may be of interest to them or they can suggest various topics. It comes back to the comments come back to the standards review board. The standards review board reviews them and, and we prioritize whether it's you know, immediate need, medium term or long term um, goals and whether it falls to maybe a change or a new standard or whether it's a prospective paper or some, some other type of response. And then we assign it to a technical committee where they they work on a project. And when they're done, standards review board looks at it and then we, we expose it for public comment. So whenever the response is, it's again exposed for public comment. We take those back, synthesize that, and then the, the standards are updated. But sometimes it takes, you know, year, two years process because of the exposure time and the time just to, to work on those um, those particular set of standards. Okay. So some of the new things we're looking at, um, just briefly, inventory it was out for exposure. So we have something on inventory. We have something on autom automated valuation models, allocation of value. Um, we're not going to look at um, ESG and internal generated intangible assets um, in the future. Okay, uh, Pavel sir, valuer will has put a lot of onus and responsibility on valuer. Whereas the role of management and valuer need to be save, segregated, non-availability of quality data in is also a concern. How to balance between rights and responsibility of registered valuer in India? You have rightly mentioned that uh, the law is harsh, but it is harsh only those who are wrongdoers. But how to balance this right and responsibility of registered value? Uh, the, the rights and responsibility, as I said, that there is always a presumption of bona fide. So if the, to the extent the data is available and the quality of data or is in available is the valuers are right in whatever they are doing if they have followed and adhere to the laid down standards. The responsibility, of course, if the data is not available or quality of data is faulty, then valuer is as good as the data he gets in the domain. So he is not only to do the kind of uh, presume the figures or kind of. So I'll say they are pretty well balanced. And Pavan, let me tell you that at this stage, probably these things are still left to the, the future regulator, which will come into being NIV, that is the National Institute of Valuers, which will be a regulator kind IBBI only. And all these steps, rights, duties, they would be codified by them only. So it is not the stage. 
as i said regulation the the current trend is to make incomplete law that is the basic structure you lay down and leave the details to the future which will be enacted through regulation making okay uh, mark uh, uh, can you just tell uh, how uh, how you are dealing with uncertainties like covid so covid is uh, is a is a pandemic and nobody has realized in unprecedented and there is no uh, solution also there is no future uh, uh, parameters are available and and you can't predict also the how much time it will take so how you the valuer should take place and how, what is your standard saying yeah so um that's an excellent question uh, so there's a couple of types of risk dealing with that type of uncertainty one is risk from the investor standpoint so you know um we don't know the outcome. We don't know whether it's going to be a V shape, economic, a U shape, L shape, or whatever letter. So that's one set of, of risk factors. And that's obviously part an integral part of the valuation. However, there's a separate set of risk factors related to the valuation process itself. And so the IVSC has issued a paper on for guidance for valuation um, specialists on how to deal with uncertainty in the valuation process. So not just the risk of the investment themselves, but the risk of actually doing the valuation. So in other words, information's changed, the, the markets have changed. So if you took a multiple in, you know, as of 1231.19, is that really appropriate as of September 1st, 2020? And maybe, maybe not. Um, if, uh, if you use forecasts that were prepared at the end, at the beginning of 2020, are they still appropriate today? Maybe, maybe not. So that's uncertainty. It's part of the valuation process. So what we yeah, issue this paper is just some thoughts about guidance to valuation professionals, some things to think about when you're doing your valuation. You know, how do you how do you treat that kind of stuff? So some you know some examples might be um, in 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 prospective financial information doing various scenarios of outcomes rather than just relying on one set. If you're looking at multiples rather than just looking at it as of a date, maybe looking at uh, multiple different ways, looking at it um, a longer term, looking at future multiples, uh, you know, uh, expectations. So I think it, it just the uh, the amount of information synthesis, I think, increases for the valuation specialist. Okay, Chandar, what, how you are doing this uncertainty when the valuation is coming to you? So again, like one of the ways we are doing is that uh, more validation of the business model is uh, what we are doing. And also like Mark mentioned, uh, in a market approach, we are not relying on a particular date. We are taking a longer period average. And essentially, you know, it is more important to look at what the company has recently done. Like we, we are already five, six months in the pandemic. So what is the performance in the six months? How the strategy has worked? and how, how the companies have reduced their cost. Because when the companies reduce cost, uh, their profits may be same, so their valuation may not be affected. We are not doing valuation on top line. We are doing valuation on the profitability and cash flows. So, so long as the cash flows remain constant, maybe there is some deferral of five months or a year. It shouldn't adjust. It also depends upon industry, actually. For example, a pharmaceutical industry, uh, actually is not affected and FMCG industry is little affected, but our tourism industry is badly affected. So it depends upon the company and industry as well. Okay. Pavan sir, draft valuer bill does not include valuation standard. So when will India valuation standard will be made available for public comments? Maybe when you are saying institution will come, but when we are talking about the standard, so this is not part. What is your comment on this? It, it talks about uh, setting up of valuation standards committee. It, it is not that it is silent on that. It, it talks about setting up of a valuation standards committee, which will consist of the professionals who are uh, experts in the field. And then their job will be to evolve again the specific standards or maybe adopt something. So we have left it to the uh, discretion of their so it is, it is not that it doesn't talk it talks we are conscious okay. of this 
Okay, Pawan sir, same question. The valuation report prepared in foreign land as per foreign law accepted in India because when your law will come, the, the valuation law is there. What will be the position in future? Sorry, Pawan, I didn't get uh, your question. Is valuation report prepared in foreign land as per foreign laws accepted in India? I can't comment on this, but we uh, our idea is you see uh, one of the things I would like to share is the study material prepared by IBBI, which is available. In fact, that has been developed by one of the RVOs. It is available on our website with regard to plant and machinery running into more than 2000 pages. And it is the same study material has been adopted by the international jurisdictions to be put on their website. So ultimately what we look at is the convergence of global best practices, whether it is outside India or India, the valuation and the professionals, we want mutual recognition and ultimately have the Indian valuers, we feel that they will may rather make a mark on the international valuation scene. And that is why with that in mind, uh, there, there has been no stoppage of uh, professionals from either side. And that is why LLPs, firms and corporates have been allowed to enter into this valuation practice under the current rules which are notified. Sir, the, uh, because we have to go a long way because the way Mark is explaining that IBS 200 plant uh, and machine, the 300 IBS portfolio, 400 uh, IBC, IBS and uh, financial instrument is IBS 500. So they have developed so many things. So we are starting this. So we have to go a long way to uh, uh, meet out the global standard and global things. It's fine that every day we need not coin out everything. So whatever carve out is required, that is what we are leaving it to the experts. So yeah. that is why I said the, uh, the valuation standards committee will consist of the subjects uh, spe specialists who would go into such role and come out with their own recommendations. Like in IFRS, we have also adopted international best practices and made out Indian carve outs. So the first, the, there has to be an aggregation of the valuation professionals in India. In other international jurisdictions, you please appreciate that there are uh, only one class of valuers which cater to each and every segment of the user there. Here we have pockets of valuers who are catering to that particular segment of user only. Unless we have, have aggregators together, they all aggregate under one umbrella, then the standards will also evolve to that extent. Mr. Mark, there is, a, uh, is there any initiative to confluence the IFRS and IBS? Any update on this? Yeah, so um, there are conversations that go back and forth um, among the our technical people and the um, ISB's technical people um, all the time. So they have uh, calls uh, on a regular basis to talk about um, accounting issues that may have evaluation implication. So we're, we're providing inputs from technical perspective um, on that basis. But also, um, we meet, we tend to meet, um, when, we're, when there were in-person meetings, uh, we met with the IASB, um, some of the representatives from the board itself with our standards review board and just discussed, you know, projects that we're working on. They talked about project, future projects that they're working on and how perhaps we can work together just to um, provide one another advice on, on various issues. So there, there are discussions going back and forth. As far as in the US, um, we've met with the um, technical person that's leading the um, project of perhaps changing goodwill impairment. We've had discussions with him numerous times. He shows up at regular meetings that, uh, that we attend as IBSC meetings. So we have conversations going um, at, in the US as well. Okay. Okay, so last two questions, last uh, two questions for this. Uh, Mark, Pawan just, can I you... would, Pawan? Yeah, yeah. Pawan, before yeah, yeah. to interrupt you, on I just checked up the bill, which I have draft bill. The, the 
the three deals with valuation standards of the proposed bill. So we have not left uh, the valuation standards. Okay. The okay. Uh, chapter for three, section 21 and section 21, yes. It deals exclusively with valuation standards. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm also, Sorry, please, I'm, please, please. Yeah, so thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Mark, uh, can you explain how mandatory performance framework, the MPF, helps in uniformity? Yeah, so it, it the mandatory performance framework, again, discusses how much work needs to be done. Not It's not a how-to, it's not a technical standard. So it's a framework. Uh, it doesn't meet the definition of a standard. However, the, the idea it's designed to provide more consistency in terms of um, the process that evaluation uh, professional goes through as far as collecting information, documenting the information, documenting the thought process. And the idea behind that is, so when it gets audited, it helps with the audit process. So there's some uniformity across valuation specialists performing valuations for financial reporting so that when auditors look at it, they, they know it's done to a consistent level. Okay, so last questions to all three participants. And, uh, uh, what is uh, your view, Pawan, sir, the future of valuation in India? Extremely bright. As the economy grows, valuation profession is bound to see, I think, I, I don't see, it will, it will grow in leaps and bounds. I think it will have exponential growth of this profession, I see. And valuation professionals are, I see them a global role, not only in India, but in fact, uh, to be making their mark on the global scene. Okay, Chandar, what is your view? My view is that it's high time that professionals should start looking at valuation as a full-time practice. Because once you start looking at full-time practice, you will dedicate and give it your efforts. There is a lot of learning that needs to be done. It's not that we say that adapt IBS. If we don't know how to do it, it is always you can land in trouble. So anyone who wants to do it, do it full time. And it's very bright. I mean, I can't give a number to it, but it's very, very bright. Mark, uh, my last questions to you, uh, which is a combination of both. What do you think about the future of this in India and in global? Sure. Yeah. I, I, first of all, I think it's an exciting time to be a valuation expert in, in India because you're developing a profession, a truly a pro profession. And that's, you know, it takes a lot of work. It's a lot of, you know, steps, a lot of, you know, discussion and so on. But it, it's well worth that whole process. Um, so I just the only advice to give you, there's a lot of, you know, ground that's already plowed, for example, in, in IBS standards and other areas that, you, you know, you can look to or ask others for help and advice as well. Um, so it's it's just an exciting time. But as far as the future, the future is extremely bright in India. Um, I think it's great. We are truly coming together as an international profession. Um, and I think that that helps um, the public trust. You know, we've mentioned that each each of the speakers discuss the public trust and our role as valuation experts in in um, developing the public trust in the work product that, that we're doing. And the end result's more efficient capital markets. It's uh, better for the, the economies, better for financial reporting purposes. It just enhances um, um, the the economics, global uh, global economy, global capital markets. So, are you working for any global globalization of this profession by uh, taking help of different jurisdiction? like uh, the one regulator is sitting two regulators are sitting here so because they are uh, ma, ma, the all the technical part has to be developed by the technical team yeah, okay yeah. but regulatory part that ethical value what are the process new things that regulator will do but ultimately all the valuation principle are same in the entire world so mm -hmm. are you planning to develop a global body which can manage the valuation and are you in touch with the Indian regulator where you can help your uh, expertise and your journey so they can uh, do something in a different manner and, and, and in, a, in, a, uh, in a global aspects. Yes, yeah, so, so if you think about the profession, it's kind of like a 
different levels, right? You have valuation professional organizations or regulators in, in various markets. And then you have IBSC sets st standards globally. So it, it, it's, it's a very great framework in the sense that we have valuation professional organizations that can provide best practices and what they're seeing in their local markets. And we can synthesize all that information from across the world and develop a truly uniform set of standards that is the, that are the best practices that people are seeing in different markets. But it's also flexible enough that you know it's not a prescribed standard set of standards where we say okay this it's either this or nothing. It's it's flexible enough. It's principles based where it could be adapted for local customs, local markets, local regulations. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jayala. Uh, I think you have to uh, it's a very interesting Indian concept which Mr. Pawan Kumar can also see, the valuation of Indian MNCs, the yeah. company which are parent company is outside India, and the, they have a their subsidiary company in India, their valuation is very high as compared to their parent countries. So the, the difference of Indian prospect and the international prospect is quite different. So the standard will have to face some challenges. Last yeah. word from Pawan Kumar, sir, and then we, we can close this uh, session, sir. Well, just one comment to make that what you said was in, in the Indian tax scenario, we have seen that aspect more so in transfer pricing as well as enterprise valuation. So you rightly said otherwise uh, dividend payouts we have observed that tendency of uh, Indian of deriving more value and Vodafone case, of course, I was there in the uh, revenue tax policy. So we have seen those kind of developments from close quarters. But yes, the, the concluding remark, uh, remark I want to make is you have made Friday evening as a time of uh, uh, joy in terms of distribution of this knowledge purely you get in uh, joy you get in dissemination of knowledge i think we all have benefited from the experts expertise of mark zaila as well as chandar so i think and and of course the uh, variety of questions which you asked uh, which the brother the participants have raised to make this as an intellectually stimulating exercise so thank you all thanks a lot thank you thank, you, thank you very much sir you very much sir so now uh, before uh, uh, just two minutes sir before concluding this i thanks everybody especially mark uh, jaila who has uh, who was traveling to uh, different places and he has come back uh, yesterday evening thank you marks for your valuable input and it will definitely help to develop this profession uh, thank you Pavan kumar sir for your encouraging words and always uh, coming and supporting the professionals i'm seeing since last 15 to 15 years you are always coming forward and sharing your knowledge and thoughts upfrontly and thank you um, uh, uh, manoj pandey sir for your valuable comments i know secretary is calling you again and again and he is very uh, busy uh, uh, just for some urgent work Thanks for your good words and thank you Kanda, for giving insight and most important thanks to all the participants, those who have come in big number to uh, to participate in this and they have asked, uh, I think we have received more than 55 questions which we have tried, some questions were common and some questions I am not taking which are very for uh, uh, a specific subject so that i am not taking this a query base and i'm assuring you chandar will reply to all the questions to all of you those who have sent and we have not giving reply just now for the paucity of time so thank you very much friend so in continuation to our this particular uh, journey of sharing knowledge next friday on 4th september 4 pm so uh, pavan sir uh, uh, for no normally we are organizing program at four o'clock but because Jaila has to get up at five o'clock there, that's why we have shifted to six o'clock. So uh, otherwise we are doing at four o'clock so you can enjoy uh, the knowledge and then enjoy the actual enjoyment which you want to do. So we are having on 4th September Friday at four o'clock. We are organizing one program on mandatory dematerialization of shares and issue connected with form PAS6. 
we are receiving so many queries so many confusion are there so that's why we were organizing program on producer company but we are organizing this program first because last date is coming and various queries are there and this is applicable to all companies so we are organizing this and on 11th september we are organizing program on fraud corporate fraud and various aspects of securities fraud and corporate fraud or you meant to say white collar crime so thank you very much to all for participating and thank you jaila and thank you mr pawan kumar sir for this thank you thank you very much yeah thank you pleasure